Darth Vader isn't just the most iconic villain in the Star Wars universe, he's one of the greatest movie bad guys of all time. But there's still a lot to be said about this legendary Sith Lord. Here are a few things you might not know about Darth Vader. When it comes to the most revisited roles in Hollywood, Darth Vader is right up there with the best in terms of providing work for actors. An awful lot of folks have done time under that big black helmet. Darth Vader has made official and unofficial appearances in more than 200 different movies, video games, and TV episodes once you include parodies and cameos. To give you an idea of just how big a big deal Darth Vader is, consider that Han Solo has only around 100 screen credits to his name. Between the prequels, the spin-offs, the games, the animated series, the trilogy that started it all, and Vader's various crossover appearances, he's not just one of the most ubiquitous characters in Star Wars-related projects. He's one of the most recognizable pop culture figures on Earth. Which is kinda weird, considering he's barely in that first movie. That's right, Darth Vader, the most iconic villain in all of sci-fi, was in 1977's A New Hope for just 12 minutes. Even Chewbacca got more time in front of the camera than Vader. But those 12 minutes were all it took to leave a lasting impression and create a villain whose legacy will last for generations. While Anakin Skywalker might be known for his intense emotional anguish, Vader himself has another cross to bear. Outright physical torture. And most of that came courtesy of his armor. Underneath his sleek cyber suit are several layers of rotting flesh that never healed after his fateful lava bath on Mustafar. Oh man. I just don't get this. You know, it's not easy to find things to match this mask. As you might expect, the nerve damage to Vader was pretty immense, and he is forced to take all kinds of numbing agents and sanitation baths on the regular. There's also the fact that his helmet is bolted to his head and continually pierces him with needles to keep his mind synced with the suit. Basically, not a second of Vader's life goes by without him having to endure searing pain. His constant torture, however, allows him to drown in his anger, becoming a stronger Sith Lord with every passing day. When you think about it, any of Vader's numerous enemies could have taken him out pretty easily if they managed to get the jump on him during his weaker suitless state. And it's a testament to his power and menace that nobody ever did. While tradition tasks the Jedi with crafting their own lightsabers, the Sith tend to undergo a much darker ritual. To create their red lightsabers, Sith Lords have to steal a Jedi's kyber crystal, warping the once benign object with rage, fear, and loss. Basically, all the buzzwords of the Sith. 2018's Darth Vader comics reveal that Vader stole his crystal and hilt from a Jedi named Kirok in Fila. But this original iteration of the weapon, as shown in the comics, isn't the one fans have come to associate with Vader. After using the Jedi stolen hilt for a while, he eventually crafts one that matches up much better with his tech-driven armor. The change in the weapon's aesthetic isn't by choice, though. Bounty hunters almost destroyed Vader's stolen saber during an attempt on his life. Palpatine explains the process to his apprentice by assuring him that there isn't any real difference between the blades of the Jedi and the Sith, except that the crystal that powers the Sith version of the weapon, as he puts it, has been made to bleed. Despite taking his saber in the Sith-approved manner, however, Vader's fighting style is actually pretty unique. This comes across in the movies, too. Darth Vader's two-handed lightsaber swordplay tends to be far more brutal than other Jedi, and even more brutal than his younger self. As a young Jedi, Anakin Skywalker favored the same Form 5 lightsaber technique that Luke Skywalker would one day use against him. But once Anakin became Vader, he modified his Form 5 style to accommodate the limitations and channel the full power of his life-supporting armor. For Vader, choosing to build his imposing castle on Mustafar was less about marking his spiritual birthplace and more about lamenting the loss of his wife, Padme. In Darth Vader issues 22 to 25, Vader begins building the first version of his castle with the help of Sith Lord Momin, whose spirit is contained inside a helmet that Palpatine had given his apprentice. Momin promises that building a castle on Mustafar would give Vader the chance to make contact with his lost love. So, with the dead Sith Lord's help, Vader constructs several different designs of his fortress on the site of his greatest defeat. After a battle with the locals and a sudden yet unsurprising betrayal from Momin, Vader sends his assistant back into the abyss. He then succeeds in his mission to cross the veil between life and death, departing from his body and going on a journey into the Force itself. Here, Vader's spirit melds between his life as Anakin and his current state as Vader, and he even receives a few fuzzy snippets from the future. He finally reaches Padme, though. Whether it's her spirit or Vader's memory of her isn't really clear. 
Unfortunately for the Sith Lord, she immediately rejects him, insisting that Anakin is dead and that she doesn't know the man standing before her. Padme then plummets into an abyss of fire and Vader is finally forced to let her go, which was most likely Palpatine's plan all along. For decades, fans have debated whether or not Grand Moff Tarkin knew of Vader's former identity as Anakin Skywalker. The Clone Wars series shows Anakin fighting alongside Tarkin, where he witnesses the young Jedi's skills and his deep relationship with the Force. A mutual respect forms between the two before either became entangled with the Empire. The canonized novel Tarkin takes the theory a step further, however, as the Imperial Stooge mulls over the similarities between Anakin and Vader. At one point, Tarkin outright theorizes that Vader may well be the Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker. Later in the novel, Palpatine queries whether Tarkin knows the secret and uses it to test his followers' loyalty. And Tarkin passes the test. As a regional governor, he could have done anything with this information but chooses to keep silent instead. Subsequently, Tarkin becomes the only character to have shown any kind of genuine respect for both Anakin and Vader, despite his skepticism of the Force. Leia Organa was the first of the Skywalker twins to meet Darth Vader in A New Hope, so it's only fitting that she was the first to face him in battle, on the planet of Rogus Voss. In the 2016 comic storyline Vader Down, Leia orders the Rebels to drop a fleet of Y-Wing bombs on Vader. The showdown takes place between the aftermath of New Hope and the beginning of The Empire Strikes Back, fresh off the back of the destruction of Alderaan. And while the films never adequately address Leia's sense of loss when Tarkin and Vader destroy their home planet, here she is willing to die to avenge her people and her family. When C-3PO points out that ordering the bombing of Vader will certainly kill Leia too, she accepts it, willing to do anything to bring down her opponent. Obviously though, Leia's attempt on Vader's life fails quite dramatically and Leia's father lives to fight another day. Before he succumbed to the power of the dark side, the young Anakin Skywalker created the fussy, squeamish droid fans know as C-3PO. Unfortunately, he also simultaneously created one of the more notable plot holes in the Star Wars universe. If Anakin made C-3PO, why didn't he recognize the droid when they ran into each other during the original trilogy? Well, in the now-defunct Legends continuity, the two do actually have a reunion of sorts. In the comic, Thank the Maker, Vader finds 3PO's disassembled body on Cloud City and shares a brief, tender moment with his old droid. But even in Disney's new canon, these two have a connection that goes beyond the movies. In the comic Star Wars 75, the Sith Lord finds himself helping his old creation, albeit unknowingly. In a selfless effort to depower a set of bombs in an earlier issue, C-3PO elects to face deactivation himself to save a planet and the rock creatures living there. Meanwhile, Vader, who was injured in a scuffle, retreats to tend to his wounds. When Vader uses an energy blast to power back up, he unwittingly revives his old droid. Unraveling a slight Easter egg reference to his origins, the C-3PO says thank the Maker as Vader's blast breathes life back into him. If only he knew how right he was. It's not exactly a secret that George Lucas was telling fibs when he claimed to have plotted out every major detail of his Star Wars saga from the beginning. Between the many continuity discrepancies and early scripts popping up over the years, fans have debunked his claim repeatedly. Taking a step beyond speculation, an actual deleted scene from A New Hope sheds further doubt on Lucas's claim. In an extended version of the scene in which Luke reunites with his old buddy Biggs, Red Leader reveals he once met Luke's father. I met your father once when I was just a boy. He was a great pilot. You've got half the skill he had, you'll do all right. Red Leader isn't exactly forthcoming with any information regarding where he met Luke's father, so you could technically argue that it still works for continuity's sake. For example, he could easily have met Anakin before he turned to the dark side. Since few people knew that Anakin was Vader, those who remembered the former Jedi likely assumed that he was dead. And Red Leader could well have figured out the connection between Anakin Skywalker and Luke Skywalker. Then again, that doesn't account for the fact that Anakin Skywalker's ghost actually shows up in an early draft of the script for The Empire Strikes Back. All in all, it's probably best to just assume Lucas has been Indiana Jonesing it from the beginning. Oh, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. Darth Vader's game-changing revelation at the end of The Empire Strikes Back is one of the most misquoted moments in cinematic history when Darth Vader responds to Luke's accusation that Vader killed his father. No, I am your father. Countless fans misremember the quote as Luke, I am your father. The site lovefilm.com once polled over 1,500 film buffs to determine which misquote rules the galaxy. Survey says, it's Vader's reveal. Even James Earl Jones himself says the line incorrectly in the documentary Empire of Dreams, the story of the Star Wars trilogy. Of course, you can kind of see why the misquote came about. 
It contextualizes the scene in question and makes the sentiment even more personal and dramatic. Given the Skywalker's flair for the dramatic, it's almost a shame that the altered line isn't the canonical version. In fact, since the wrong quote is so ubiquitous, there's a good chance that a lot of fans will have heard the incorrect version before they've even seen the movie, making the actual reveal somewhat of a letdown. Although Vader's appearance midway through Rogue One, A Star Wars Story was written into the script from the get-go, his more famous scene was very much a last-minute addition. Everyone knows this scene by now. It's the intense hallway battle sequence in which a besieged ship full of rebels race to escape with their stolen blueprints for the Death Star, while Darth Vader hunts them down. This sequence has since become a fan favorite, made that much more remarkable by the fact that it was tacked on at the last possible moment, after the editor on Rogue One argued that Vader needed more screen time. As director Gareth Edwards explains, we were cutting the film together, and my editor Jabez Olson, he said, I think you need one last moment with Darth Vader, like one more badass moment with him. But the timeline to get this scene done was extraordinarily tight. According to Edwards, when he mentioned this, it was about four months maybe from release. Ultimately, the sequence was shot in three days, an incredible feat for a last minute edit that ended up being among the most memorable scenes in the entire film. What's more, every movement Vader makes in that scene is totally faithful to his past appearances. As Edwards says, I think the golden rule was not to let Vader do anything that hadn't been seen or established in the original trilogy. As a result, Vader wields his lightsaber and uses the Force to choke his foes, all stuff he had done during those first three films. There certainly wasn't any of this going on. For most of the original Star Wars trilogy, the man behind the mask was David Prowse, a bodybuilder whose six-foot, five-inch build was perfect for bringing Vader's imposing physical presence to the screen. But thanks to an unfortunate communication breakdown between Prowse and George Lucas, the actor apparently didn't realize that his voice would be replaced by James Earl Jones in post-production. And he wasn't exactly happy when he learned the truth. Prowse was rumored to be difficult on the set thereafter, refusing to learn the lines for The Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi. And his feud with George Lucas eventually reached the point at which Prowse was no longer invited to participate in events with the rest of the cast. However, Prowse does deserve credit for his contributions to the series, particularly the climactic scene in which Darth Vader redeems himself to save Luke. The athletic actor needed only one take to pluck the Emperor off the ground and pitch him overboard. Unfortunately, you can definitely see why Lucas wanted to dub over Prowse's voice. While the bodybuilder had the perfect build to play Vader, his speaking voice, which was high-pitched and West Country accented, didn't fit the bill at all. If you're wondering what Lord Vader would have sounded like as an Englishman, there are a few pre-dub scenes still floating around that feature Prowse speaking Vader's lines. This ship carries the crest of Alderaan. Was there any of the royal family on board? Who were you carrying? Carrie Fisher, in true Carrie Fisher fashion, even began referring to Prowse on set as Darth Farmer. It's not exactly terrifying. The drama between Lucasfilm and David Prowse extends further than on-set shenanigans and a ban from official events, though. Prowse had a minor appearance in the documentary The People vs. George Lucas, which interviewed fans and people officially affiliated with Star Wars, encouraging them to gripe about Lucas' failings. In this documentary, Prowse discusses the idea that the franchise sold out to make money in merchandising, saying, Return of the Jedi was the beginning. The merchandising raised its ugly head, and then the whole thing became super commercial from then onwards. According to the Daily Beast, however, Prowse didn't even know the purpose of the documentary. It's entirely plausible that the filmmakers didn't give any background on the project as they appear to have interviewed him on the fly in the middle of an autograph line. The film cuts out any prelude to Prowse's answer, making it possible that the interviewer insinuated the desired response within the question without much context. Mark Hamill almost suffered the same fate, admitting to Vulture, I almost got hornswoggled into that documentary. They weren't calling it The People vs. George Lucas at the time, but I could tell from the questions they were asking me that it was an open invitation to trash George. Return of the Jedi producer Howard Kazanjan claims that only three completed scripts of the film ever existed. They belonged to Lucas, Kazanjan, and director Richard Marquand. Regarding Prowse's access to sensitive dialogue in the script, Kazanjan says, for delicate information lines, he would simply count one, two, three, four, or read a fictitious line in character to the real dialogue. But this secrecy didn't save Prowse from paying the price for leaking Vader's death to a tabloid. According to Prowse, a reporter contacted him at the gym to set up an interview about his weightlifting career. But the journalist turned the tables on the actor, telling him that Vader was getting killed off. The reporter also claimed that another actor would appear behind the mask. When Prowse looked at his call sheet, it read, Dave Prowse, Darth Vader, Studio One, and Sebastian Shaw, Anakin Skywalker, Studio Ten. 
Just one day after the interview, the Daily Mail published an article revealing Vader's death, suggesting that Prowse himself had leaked the information. Decades later, the documentary I Am Your Father set the record straight, getting the journalist to admit that Prowse didn't spoil anything and that the leak came from another source. But the massive spoiler was the final straw for Lucasfilm. His stuntman Bob Anderson mostly donned the Vader armor in Return of the Jedi, and Prowse was nearly cut out of the movie altogether. The final betrayal for Prowse, however, came in the form of Vader's helmet reveal. Because when a redeemed Anakin Skywalker looks on Luke with his own eyes, it's not Prowse's eyes that are doing the looking. Actor Sebastian Shaw appeared in the small scene, a slap in the face to Prowse, who was under the impression that he would be unmasked at some point during the series. To make matters worse, Prowse told Equity Magazine that he still hasn't received residual payments from Return of the Jedi because it hasn't made a profit, and added, If there's a pot of gold somewhere that I ought to be having a share of, I would like to see it. Despite the drama, however, Prowse still has a positive outlook on his Star Wars experience. As he told The Void, Well, I'm grateful for everything that's happened to me from Star Wars. It altered my career completely. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.